And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of, the, of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembering of his mercy, in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. As New Covenant believers, we sit in an interesting time in history. Um, we get to look back on Christ's first coming, his advent with us here. But we also look forward to his return as well. So we get to sing the song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, not only just as those who were looking forward to the Messiah coming in the first, but we look forward even now to see when his return will be, when our Emmanuel will come and rule and reign in his kingdom. If you would stand with me, let's sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
If you go with me to Psalm 98. Psalm 98. Well, I, I challenged you at the beginning of the Christmas season to, to really meditate on the words that we sing together in Christmas songs, and I hope you've done that. I mean, what rich theology we just sang. Second Adam. The, the, the image marred, but reinstated, amen? Maybe you're one of those people that, I think I did this a few weeks ago on a Wednesday. Let's do it on a Sunday morning, all right? How many of you, Christmas music starts in, let's go really early. Let's say summer. Let's just say sometime in the summer. Anybody that crazy? All right, we got a few crazy ones. How many of you, yeah, I know, my dad, I know. Uh, my, dad, my dad is one of those people that Christmas music isn't a season, it's just a genre. Like, we listen to it all the time, right? How many of you, that's how you are, all the time. Anybody, any time of the year? All right. Um, it's really a good thing to do, truthfully. We, we, we make fun of it, but. All right, how about, how about you start in, like, October? It's fall time. All right, Thanksgiving. As soon as Thanksgiving is done. Scrooges who don't listen to Christmas music? Well, then today is for you. There are some, in the world of, so I love Christmas, okay? I'm about to say something controversial, but I love Christmas. In the world of Chris, Christian Christmas music, it's like really good. Deep stuff. Well written. Good lyrics. Doctrinal stuff. In the world of non-Christian Christmas music, it's kind of si- I mean, there's a lot of it's really silly, right? Just silly. I mean, I love it. I listen to it. I like White Christmas just as much as the next guy. Don't shoot me. But there's one Christmas song in particular that I think has some really odd lines. Um, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Okay, have we ever just stopped? There'll be scary ghost stories and tales of the glories of Christmases long, long ago. Okay, first of all, who's gathering around their Christmas tree and going, all right, children, you want to hear a good ghost story? How festive! Now, I get it. Maybe you're talking about Scrooge. I think that's probably giving that song a little too much credit, all right? I don't think he's talking about Ghost Christmas, you know, past, present, and future. Um, and tales of the glories of Christmases long, long ago. I mean, how much better were the Christmases then than they are now? What were you doing in those Christmases? Like, man, Christmas today is good, but you should have been there a long time ago. As Christmas goes, they used to be so much better. And sometimes we get sucked into that idea of nostalgia, and I know what they mean. It's just, again, it's, it's leaning into this idea of nostalgia. And believe it or not, I'm actually much more nostalgic than you might think. I'm not a robot. But it is kind of a funny idea that, you know, we, we're just suggesting that the way that a Christmas has to be better is that it is a Christmas of the past. And today, we are going to deal with a song in the Bible, a Christmas song, loosely interpreted, that talks about how much better our celebration will be in the future. Psalm 98. We're going to read the entirety of the psalm. It's not very long. Psalm 98. Oh, sing to the Lord. A new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, 
with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. What an incredible, thrilling, joyous text of Scripture we have before us to study. Would you pray with me? And then we'll work through this song together. Father, we're thankful. Jesus, we are rejoicing. And Spirit, we are submissive. Or at least I hope that we are. I pray that you would use this text to to spur us on to, to greater praise, to greater passion, to pure living, to a clearer picture of who you are, Father, and what you've done for us in Christ. Would you, would you use this text to settle us where we are in our life right now? For many, it may be true of them that they can think of a better time in their life, a happier Christmas, a happier season. It's been challenging for many of our loved ones. And so I pray that you would use this text to settle us where we are and build an anticipation for what is to come. And we thank you that whether we can remember a happier Christmas than now, or now is good as human, in human terms, we thank you that the center of it, Christ, never changes. And he is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And so would you help us to enjoy him now from the word. And we ask these things through Jesus. Amen. Well, this is, as you notice, a song as all of the Psalms are. So we've been in the Psalms for uh, the last Wednesdays, the last, I guess, two and a half years, almost, well, more than that, three years. We are working steadily towards the end. And so those of you who know the Word, know the Psalms, been a part of those Wednesday studies, you know that all of these are songs. This is the Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew hymn book. These are intended to be sung, and there's a wide array of of styles and and of themes. And this particular song is is commonly labeled a royal song because it deals with the aspect of kingship. We'll talk about that in a few moments. But we're right from the, from the outset in verses 1 through 3, we're, we're driven to see clearly the content of the song. And so we see in verses 1 through 3 that the people of God are supposed to sing a song of salvation. The people of God are supposed to sing a song of salvation. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for He has done marvelous things. And then what the psalmist is going to do is he's going to give us a series of things that cause our singing. Sing to the Lord a new song, for He has done marvelous things. First of all, the the reason we sing is because He's done great things. And the specificity of that greatness we'll see in the text as we go along, that 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 marvelous thing, that greatness, has a a specific scope. We're going somewhere with it primarily. But, but, But outside of that, generally, God has done great things for His people. He's a God of great things because He is a great God. God can only do great things. So He's done great things. We, we, we sing to Him a new song for who He is. He's holy and He's mighty. We see that and as we continue in verse 1. His right hand and His holy arm. He's a powerful hand. He's holy in His person. You understand that these are images the psalmist uses to help us understand God. God doesn't have a body. He is a spirit, but he works powerfully as though he had a powerful arm to work with. He intervenes. He protects with that arm. He cares with that arm. He upholds with that arm. He strengthens us with that arm. His strong arm is the source of any strength that we might have in this life to face or with which to face this life. And he's holy. This is not simply one of the attributes that we study of God. This is one of the founding attributes of God. 
holy, holy, holy. He is absolutely separate from us. Distinct from us. And this is the primary aspect for which we praise God. He has worked salvation. His right hand and His holy arm have worked salvation, but note the next word, for Him. He's worked salvation for who? Who do we naturally orient that to? Ourselves. He saved me. Amen. And we should praise Him for that. But the psalmist wants us to begin by noting that He has worked salvation for Him. Not that He needs salvation, but that He receives the glory for our salvation. Listen, the primary benefactor of our salvation is God. Because the saved people recognize Him for who He is and offer Him the praise that He is due. Therefore, that means that any benefit we receive from the salvation of God is what? Grace. An extension, an overflow, an abundance of His goodness poured out towards us. So He saves. Not only has He saved, verse 2, He's made known His salvation. He has revealed His salvation. He's revealed, right, he's revealed His righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has made salvation available, knowable, accessible. And how has He done this? Well, ultimately, He's done this in the form of His Son, as we know. Literally, He has made salvation come to us. But He's revealed His righteousness. And how does He ultimately reveal His righteousness like we discussed last week? How does He fully express Himself to us? His Son. In the beginning was the Word, the fullest expression of the Father. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So how has He revealed His righteousness? Through His Son, the righteousness of God made flesh. How do we know His salvation? Well, remember what Paul tells us about the sufficiency of the Scripture. The Word is able to make you wise unto salvation. He's revealed salvation personally in the form of His Son, provisionally to us in the Scriptures. And note next, He has opened His salvation. He has revealed it in the sight of the nations. What nations? More than one. Because God, in His goodness, Ephesians 1 and 2, has had a plan to unite all things to Himself through Christ. And that involves people inside the camp, Israel, who are now unbelieving, and people outside the camp, Gentiles. That Christ would go outside the camp and make the sacrifice for us that we may be brought in. God has intended a people unto Himself. And He has revealed that salvation to His people. And He's opened His salvation to the believing. He's opened His salvation. And finally, in verses 3, we're we're parking here just because this, this forms the entire basis for the singing, for the rejoicing. How finally, or why finally, should we sing to the Lord a song, a new song? Because He has remembered His steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. He keeps His promises. What God has said He will do. Not one iota of the Scripture will fail. The promises of God that He plants will always flower in the life of His people. He keeps His promises. He doesn't forget. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of of our God and loved one, brother, sister, we gather today on Christmas Eve acknowledging that cosmically the people have seen the salvation of God, but personally He has shown it to me. He has revealed Himself to you. You are counted among them. You are in the family. 
which is why we sing to the Lord. Listen, I glanced over this phrase to come back to it. A new song. Why do we sing a new song? Well, it's good to stay fresh. Okay, well, that's just practical. That's not what's going on here. Do you know why we sing a new song? Because God says to the prophet, I will give them a new heart. Because the gospel means that I have new life in Christ. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. I'm being transformed and renewed because I have a new mind. We are settled in a new covenant which makes all things new. Even creation. So, isn't it in keeping with the people of God who've been brought to new life that we should sing a new song of salvation? Sing to the Lord a new song of salvation. I told you this was a Christmassy text. Some of this passage was read for you. Mary, in reflecting on the glory of the Lord and Messiah being born through her, refers to this text multiple times in her song of praise. The Magnificat, Luke 1, verse 51, He has shown strength with His arm. He has helped His servant Israel and remembered His mercy. Simeon prays in the Lord for Jesus being brought to him and able to see the Messiah with his own eyes. Verse 30, for my eyes have seen your salvation. And I think he knows exactly what passage or at least what concept we should refer to. We, we know what passage we should refer to. He's referring to. The nations have seen your salvation. My eyes have seen your salvation. Verse 31. For you have prepared the salvation in the presence of all the peoples. Zechariah's prophecy in Luke 1 verse 67. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied Israel. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. For he has visited and redeemed his people. He's raised up a horn of salvation For in his house, the servant David, he spoke by the mouth of his prophets of old that we should be saved from our enemies, verse 72, to show the mercy of his promise to our fathers and remember his covenant to them. The psalm explodes with not just worshipful principles that guide us as we praise God, but it actually explodes with Christmas content as even operative figures of the Christmas narrative refer to it specifically or at least implicitly. Sing to the Lord a song of salvation. But do you note with me the song is going to continue And it is not just any song that the people are singing. It's actually another song that's going to sing, it's going to be sung by creation. Creation is going to enter the choir. So note with me, verses 4 through 6, that creation sings of a king. Sing a song of salvation. The people of God sing a song of salvation, but creation sings of a king. Make a joyful noise to the Lord who? All the earth sing, earth. Break forth into joyous singing and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with a lyre. And with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Now, not only does this psalm have specific Christmas references within the Scripture, it actually has a specific place in Christmas church history. This is the psalm that Isaac Watts based the song Joy to the World on. And why does he do that? Because the people of God sing, and then he desires that the world sing of the king. Note with me, there are several aspects 
that creation sings about. They sing of a coming king. They sing of a coming king. Look with me at verse 9. Before the Lord, He comes to judge the earth. Who comes to judge the earth? Verse 6. With trumpets and the sound of a horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. So creation sings of a coming king in verse 6. And as we continue, namely in verses 8 and 9, creation sings of a just judge. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the hills sing for joy before the Lord, the king. The Lord is the king. For he comes to what? Judge the earth, and he will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. What does this sound like? Sounds like Isaiah 9. For unto us a child is born, a king. Unto us a son is given, and the government reign of the king shall be upon his shoulder. And he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase and government of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David, over his kingdom, listen, to establish and uphold justice. And with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal, I love this. Sometimes we, we just, we accidentally leave lines off of scriptures. Because we get so hung up on the parts that we like and we know. Don't forget the last line. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. How do we know this is going to happen? God is passionate about it. He will do this. That the king will come and justice will be established. And there will be a reign that will not end. Because God is passionate to keep his promises. So what should creation do? It should break forth into singing. Why should creation break forth into singing? Because he comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. And where do we see the curse? I see it in me. You see it in you. It's affected me, but where else do we see it? Well, Paul tells us that creation itself groans with longing for redemption. You say, well, how does creation sing? Look at it. Take in the scenes of God's glory and goodness. Look in the beauty of a, just a branch of pine and take it under a microscope and see what's in there and what's in there and what's in there and Go to the Grand Canyon or go to the Alps and just be amazed. I mean, it's not like you can just do that. But you know what I mean. Just be overwhelmed, astounded at the glory. How does it not sing of the glory of God? I love this incredible contrast that Jesus makes in Luke 19. It's really an incredible passage. The triumphal entry and the children are singing Hosanna. Remember this? Are, are, Are shouting Hosanna. And what do the Pharisees say that the, that the disciple, that Jesus should do? Silence your disciples. They blaspheme. Silence those who praise. And what does Jesus say in Luke 19.40? If they will be silent, even the rocks will cry out. And loved one, Passages like this drive me to the question, I think I've asked it before, if we dwell in the creation that groans, can you imagine the creation that shouts? And this is what God has reserved for His own. A coming king, a just judge who will bring with him a righteous reign. You know, every injustice in your life that you endeavor 
to make right so passionately. You could try to control life and get back at this person and get right with this person and make justice happen, but you just can't. It's because humans can't establish this ultimately. We, we live in a harvest of peace with, as, as, growth, as, as, as grace and peace grows in our life, but it will not be ultimately accomplished. As you know, even the greatest things are tainted with conflict. Even the greatest, most glorious things experience disunity, pain. As you look at the sin in the world and you desire justice for those that you believe are being treated unjustly, because there are many. As you look at the brokenness in the news, what makes all of that right? He will come and judge the world with righteousness. Acts chapter 10, verse 41, He commanded us to preach the people and to testify that He, the one appointed by God, Christ, will, be, will judge the living and the dead. Acts 17, verse 31, because He has fixed on a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom He has appointed. Who? The King, who is coming, who has come once and will come again. And of this He has given assurance to all by raising Him from the dead. You say, well, what does that mean? It's very simple. Do you know how you can absolutely know that the peace and justice that you desire in in your own life and the life of the world and the life of others and brokenness you see that's around you, do you know how you can absolutely know with full assurance that it will be made right? Jesus lives. Jesus lives. This He has given us assurance to all by raising Him from the dead. So the people of God sing a song, a new song of salvation. Creation sings a song of a king, a song of anticipation. And as we on this day of Christmas Eve have gathered to sing and reflect upon His goodness, we acknowledge that the King, born in humility, will return in majesty. He came and was gifted by wise men, but He will come as a gift to His own. And He will not need be gifted the glory of gold, for He is the glory. And in the age to come, His light will amplify and illumine all. And so until that day, what does this song mean for us? What does Psalm 98 teach us about new salvation and anticipation of future life? On a day where you could remember so much pain, you have a loved one that passed away this year or recently, or a loved one that it wasn't recent, it was a long time ago, but it stays with you because that's what happens when we love somebody. Or when the child that you want to come home for Christmas, they're not. Or the family member that should be there isn't. And you think the best way to celebrate Christmas is to remember the ones long, long ago. What does this psalm teach us about our new song of salvation and creation song of anticipation? It teaches us this. The Christians, the Christmas means for the saved, everything will be okay. Christmas means for the saved, everything 
will be okay. Jesus is going to make all things not just right, but new. And so rejoice that the King has come and that He is returning and that we have tasted the the glories of redemption. We've tasted them. But one day, our eyes will see them. Our bodies will know them. And we will see Christ high and lifted up. Our Savior, our King, the just judge, the one to make all things new. Would you pray with me? Amen.